Man to Men is for men like me. I'm Chuck James, and I am president and founder of Sparebox Storage. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona with my wife, Kim. I hope you enjoy this episode. This is Man to Men, the audio journal for Christian men who live faithfully and lead courageously. I'm Jared Musgrove with you for an in-depth conversation with a courageous leader. Today, we've got pastor and author John Tyson. Uh, Let me say before we jump in with John, if if you're here to listen to John, blessed are you. This is going to be an uplifting conversation that you're not going to hear elsewhere. And that's part of what we do here at Man to Men. We interview people, writers, and teachers that you know, like John, like Matt Chandler, like Nancy Piercy or Paul Miller. And we also feature a lot of men and women who are leading courageously in a variety of fields, from government to comic books to, to business. We spend time with them and learn uh, not just about what they do, but how they've been formed by God, what they enjoy about leadership and creation, how they participate in what God's doing in the world. Uh, Simple and profound is our goal, both with our Lead Courageously interviews, as well as our Live Faithfully segments that are going to spend, oh, 15 minutes or so in a passage of scripture each time. And they give you conversation and inspiration to talk over with the men in your community, the men that God has put in your life. And if you like what we're doing, please subscribe and share the podcast with the men in your life, in the, in your church. And our promise is to keep it unique and to keep those in-depth conversations and biblical insights coming your way. Now, with all of that said, welcome John Tyson to Man to Men. John is a widely respected pastor and leader in New York City and the author of several books, including The Intentional Father and the upcoming Fighting Shadows. John is originally from Australia and moved to the U.S. Uh, two decades ago passionate to seek and cultivate cultural renewal in the Western church. And he's here with us today. Welcome, John Tyson. G'day, mate. How's it going? It's great. Do you always feel like you have to uh, give the Aussie greeting? That is my, that is my default. That is my life. I love uh, it. It sounds better than howdy, howdy y'all. Man, it really does. It really does. Thank you. Thank you for sharing yes. some of that heart language with us. Just right off the bat. Yes, no worries, man. I love it, man. Well, John, let's just, I love to jump right in. Again, simple and profound. Would you share with us your own story of coming to Jesus, traversing continents, um, and how you arrived at at where you are now? Doesn't have to be the short version. Yes. First, I just want to say, man, I love the vision of what you're talking about. Faithful and courageous men are the need of the hour. And it's actually Mm. tragic that you have to hold these up as values in our world today. It's tragic that something like courage and faithfulness uh, would be contested and certainly not set as a standard. So Mm. love what you're working on here. Love what you're cultivating. And uh, you're really happy to chat with you today. Um, Mm. I became a Christian uh, the week, the weekend I turned 17. Um, I did not plan to be a Christian. I dropped out of high school when I was 16. I was working in a butcher shop and uh, for a really wonderful boss, actually, very, very gifted leader. And he said to me, why don't you drop out of high school? I'll teach you how to retire by the time you're 30. When your friends are accumulating debt at university, I'll teach you how to be a manager and basically franchise stores. So I dropped out when I was 16. Um, I was the rare guy. I was sort of like a dead poet, suck the marrow out of life personality. Um, I had a VW camper van and I would just go down to the beach, surf with my friends and just party. And I loved life. I, I was a happy pagan. Underneath all of that, there was a deeper thirst. It's what C.S. Lewis uh, described as Zainzucht, which is just this profound, acute sense of longing. I was full but unfulfilled. And there's just something in me that was like, you know, to quote the Alpha course, is there more to life than this? It's going so well. So one of the, the things that I think was really interesting and makes me very, very sympathetic to seekers in the world today, I wasn't coming because of an acute sense of guilt, sin, internal deficit, failure. I was coming Mm. out of longing. And so I'm very, very susceptible to the apologetic of longing as a a tool we can use in the modern world. I started dating a girl and she said, if you want to go out with me, um, you have to come to church with me. And I remember going to church, big Pentecostal church, and just thinking, this is 100% a cult. And um, (laughs) 
<laughs> but how bad can cults be? Honestly, I mean, you know. And uh, she was really beautiful, wonderful uh, young woman. I just kept going. And I just felt this, you know, the hound of heaven start to come after me. I felt God circling around my heart. And honestly, it felt both fearful and attractive. And, um, and I became a Christian the weekend I turned 17. I had a radical encounter. Uh, it was actually a 1 Corinthians 14 experience. The secrets of your heart will be revealed. You'll fall on your face in worship and you'll say, surely God is among you. I just was in a meeting where someone gave me a prophetic word and I, I, he just shared stuff I'd never shared with anybody else, never articulated these deep longings and cries of my heart. And I just remember thinking, I've mm. never, the only person I've ever let these out to is what I would describe at the time as the universe or, you know, just, I, I just had these unspoken longings. And he just said, here's yeah. what God's doing in your heart. Yeah. Bang, I was in. And uh, then that was it. I wanted to be a pastor, serve God, be an evangelist. I was 100% in. So all my passion for life was transferred to the kingdom of God. Uh, so that's when I was 17, but I'd signed a legal document, a legal apprenticeship as a butcher, and I still had over three years left on that. So I spent the next three years um, exploring faith. I left the Pentecostal church, went to a cessationist expository preaching church, which was theological and worship whiplash. But I, I yeah. felt the same power through the word as I did through highly emotive worship in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I remember just weeping, listening to them preach through the book of uh, Hebrews. You know, one sermon, the first sermon mm. I heard was on why Jesus was a better high priest than Melchizedek. And I just remember thinking, I don't know who Melchizedek is, but yeah, I'm going to tell dive. you, Jesus mm -hmm. sounds pretty great, you know? <laughs> so I loved it. And I just remember thinking to myself, if you could combine this teaching of the Bible with the power of the Spirit and worship, this really would be something. And in that context, they were at war with each other. So that put a little bit of a quest in my life uh, for how we would describe it at our church for theology that can't be dismissed, power that can't be denied. You know, we think that's New Testament Christianity. Yeah. Paul's not at war with theology. He writes theology. And then Paul turns around and says, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Very strong word in the Greek, desire, eagerly desire, yeah. to covet, to long for. So I've spent, I wanted to go into ministry and sort of put those things together. So in the kindness of God, I got a scholarship uh, to the U.S. when I was 20, when my apprenticeship had finished, and uh, moved uh, to North Georgia in the late 1900s, uh, met my wife, and I've been married 25 years. And uh, when I came to the U.S., it just opened up another ministry world to me. Uh, this is at the time of mega churches and oh, yes. seeker-friendly, purpose-driven stuff. That's where I discovered I had the gift of leadership. Mm. Uh, all that the other churches had talked about was being anointed or being trained to teach the Bible. And um, the gift of leadership, which is in the Bible, Romans 12, 8, never came up in either of their lists. One of them was living in the miracle lists, and the other one was uh, in First Peter that just talked about uh, ministering the, the gifts of God in their various form. And uh, that's when I really got a vision for the importance of leading as a man, the power of leadership, godly leadership. Mm. So then I added that piece, leadership, power of the Holy Spirit, preaching. Then I rolled in with the emerging church, which many people will not remember, the very mm. early days before it turned legitimately heretical. And it was a group of suburban youth pastors, which is where I was, I was a suburban megachurch youth pastor, asking the question, the culture's changing, what genuinely is postmodernism and what are the implications in a growing post-Christian society? And then uh, I heard about church planting, planting churches in those sorts of environments. So uh, when I was in my mid-20s, I think it's 28. Is that late 20s? Probably late 20s. At this point, I'm married. I have two children, age two and five. And uh, I sold all my possessions, paid off all my friends' debts, like I read about in the book of Acts. And we moved to Manhattan and planted a church. And uh, now I've been here 19 years, which blows my mind. I have two adult children. My son is getting married this summer. My daughter's a senior in college, getting ready to graduate. And I've just spent the last 20 years trying to follow Jesus faithfully, preach the gospel, and make disciples in the middle of Manhattan. So Man. that's the mid-length version.
Oh yeah. No, praise God, man, for your obedience and just uh, walking. I want to talk about some of that a little later, just how you, how you hear from God, yeah. how you walk with him. Um, yeah. But just kind of dialing in, you know, a major, a major part of your ministry and why some of our guys may be tuning in or something that, that they'll learn about you really quickly mm -hmm. is that you really do have a passion for the hearts of men to, to flourish in what God has for them. It's something mm. that just bleeds out of yes. you every time I've, I've listened or read you or been around you. Um, when did this heart begin to begin to form? When did that begin to come into a, a, a clarity of vision for you that this is something that is going to be a, a major focus of my ministry? Well, it was, it was in there, but it was not clearly stated. Yeah. Um, it really was probably the last how was my son? He's about to turn 24, maybe the last 11 years. Um, I'm 47. Yeah. So my mid thirties, um, I always, so working in the, the workforce that I worked in meat factory, it's all a bunch of broken men for the most part, mm. you know, very, very rough, rough, rough neighborhood in Australia. Um, there was a, uh, there was horrible godless components to that. I mean, just awful. But there was also some moments of like rich brotherhood mm. and a sense of meaning and accomplishment because I got good at what I did. So I felt like I had honor in the community of men because I, I was recognized as skillful at my job, reliable, skillful, competent. And there was a real sense of like brotherhood, like, you know, we can handle business here. Mm. And I, I just realized, man, I really enjoy running with a crew of guys. Um, and then in many, then over the years, I always sort of found myself drifting into, I'm not much of a, like a small talk guy. When people meet me, they often say, either you're way more intense than I thought, or I expected way more banter from you. I'm a serious person. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I on, on all of the tests, on all of the tests, I'm like, I only need three, like three to seven close people brothers. I'm not a big crowd guy, relationally, in terms of getting relational energy. So I would always just be in these environments where I'd have like a little tribe of all in brothers who would just support each other, go after each other's hearts, help us through sin, struggles, deal with our marriages and parenting. So I just found myself being like, I am strangely alive around a fire pit on a Harley trip, on a motorbike trip with a, with some guys. There you go. I just love this. And uh, I just really enjoyed that environment. Um, when my son turned, as my son was getting ready to turn 13, I, I realized that we had completely lost our pathway to form boys into men in modern society, just non-existent. And, um, and so I started doing a bunch of research when he was a little younger on rites of passage, how societies formed boys into men. And uh, looked at the as a, now I'm a little older as a pastor. I'm just dealing with so many young broken men. Yes, and I said I I want to break this generational cycle. So I read all this research, created a thing called the Primal Path, which was a five year rite of passage journey. It wasn't a weekend camping trip. It was a full blown five year discipleship process. Five shifts every boy needs to make to become a man. Studying the lives of the five uh, best men in the Bible all the archetypes and skills that men need, basically how to, how to handle life, what you need to know, be, and do as a man to survive in the modern world, particularly with an emphasis on becoming like Jesus mm -hmm. as the ultimate example of biblical uh, manhood. Um, I published that. I put a course out called The Primal Path. I published that as a book called The Intentional Father. And yeah. then that really started to get some traction. Mm -hmm. And I just keep meeting dads who would reach out and say, no one did this for me. That's it. What yep. do you have for men? Yeah. And that's when it sort of clicked. Hey, I started assessing the state of men's ministry in America. There is some wonderful, godly, legacy men's ministries who have faithfully been serving men for decades. But you don't see many men's ministries starting today. And I just sort of got this sense. Maybe I'm meant to do something to serve men, to touch these fathers' hearts and then mm. deal with these young men who are out of their teenage years, but uh, it's too late for them. So too late for the sort of rite of passage teenage years. So I was uh, with a friend of mine named Jefferson Bethke. He'd done a ton of stuff on uh, families and working, uh, building family culture. And I just said to him, I don't want to do like alpha, alpha bro men. Meaning, I, I don't want to do cultural stereotypes. I, I don't own a truck. I'm in Manhattan. 
I read books. You know, probably the most stereotypical thing I do is smoke cigars, but I'm like, I'm not a, I'm just a, I'm trying to become like Jesus and fulfill my calling. Um, so I don't want to do, there's a lot of other cultural expressions that fit people in those contexts. I want to talk about forming godly men. Love and it. then we're meditating uh, on that passage in the book of Genesis that, that says, God formed the man out of the dust of the ground. Mm. God spoke creation, let there be light, but he got personally involved, a God with dirt on his hands, making man. And it says, and he breathed into his breath and he became a living being. And here is God face to face, intimately creating man in his image. I was like, man, that is what a beautiful image. That's, that's like the, the word formed there, the Hebrew word, is a, it's, a, it's a craftsman word. It means special creation, design. It's a beautiful word. We all know that men have been deformed by sin. Just, you know, examine your own heart, look around the world. And then we realize that the Bible says that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. And that Paul was in the labor pains, the childbirth, that people will be formed into the image of Jesus. And we're like, again, in Colossians 3, it says that uh, we've been, we're renewed in the image of our creator. That's getting back to this vision of being formed, but being formed in the likeness of Jesus. And I was like, let's do like a spiritual formation vision for men where the emphasis is on becoming like Jesus and not just necessarily doing um, manly traits or whatever. And can I just be honest with you? Please. I, I've never done anything that has caught on fire like this. It's just has had a grace on it. There is such a hunger. Part of it is because of the cultural confusion. We live in a world where gender is absolutely deconstructed. There's no construction of identity around manhood in a reference to God at all. It's all just dismissed as either culturally conditioned or personally subjective. And But we, even if you dismiss all of these God-given realities, you don't remove them. You just create confusion around them. And when you can actually give people biblical clarity and a pathway forward and environments where men can get to the depths of their heart, be honest with their wounds and the things that are really shaping them, and then give them a vision, regardless of what our culture says, to become like mm. Jesus and to give yourself away with a rich sacrificial mission, believe it or not, men become strangely alive. So that's uh, sort of how, how I got into it. And um, yeah, now we've got we do retreats. Uh, we do conferences and churches. We just we've got curriculum coming. Mm -hmm. uh, three courses on you know sort of helping men level up. We've got this book coming out, Fighting Shadows, which is after listening and working with thousands of men, what we think are the seven biggest issues we just kept bumping into again that we try and address. And yeah, my goal is to help men become like Jesus. And my conviction is, if the world was filled with men like Jesus in every sphere of society, politics, economics, government, high school teachers, coaches. Artists, marketing, you know, policymakers, think tanks, stay stay at home parents, whatever it is. Gosh, more of the kingdom of heaven would be on earth. So Amen, we brother. feel a real sense of mission to sort of work on that. So as do you, I know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, I, I remember reading a book. It was probably twenty years ago. I think it's by a man named Chap Clark. It's called Hurt. And the thing that he said was, we have robbed um, our children, particularly our young boys, of their meta narratives. That is their life defining stories. And what, what you just did for yes. us right there. And I think what you do is you remind men of the story they need to be living in. You're, you're giving them back that meta narrative. Um, you know, some of my, some of my story while I, uh, I serve as a director for Beta Upsilon Chi, which is a, a, a large Christian fraternity in the nation is that I spent about 20 years as a pastor sitting probably like you did across from so many men hearing those same lies. And having to do so much retroactive work to just go back where I was like, man, if I could have gotten you when you're 19 or 21 and we could take yeah. care of some of these things, we could put some of that yeah. master story back into you. I don't know if you'd be sitting yeah. in my office right now at 41 where you are. Yeah. Yeah. But the beautiful thing is, you know, the best stories, and this is why, this is fundamentally why I'm a follower of Jesus. Hmm. The best stories are stories of redemption. Amen. And uh, what can do, what God can do in a man's heart, he can restore the years of locusts have eaten. He can do in he can do in days what's been damaged in decades. And just he can, God can bring a kind of breathtaking relational repair that um you know, so I, I, we're, we're like I feel like I'm in the middle of a move of God. We've just come off our two weeks of men's retreats. Mm. 
And the level of healing, confession, hope, renouncing of lies, receiving the truth, breaking off the orphan spirit. I mean, just remarkable. So so good. It man. is a sacred work to have a man share his heart with you, open his wounds, share his shame, and then for him to be accepted, not rejected, and empowered rather than neutered, sent back into the world with a cause. It's, it's holy work. I'm really grateful to do it. That's good, man. I mean, one thing I wanted to talk about today is like you, you just kind of got this beeline in on the hearts of men um, and just talking about different messages that they hear at different points in their lives. Um, what's a message that men in their in their late teens, early 20s, kind of the, those connector years where it's all about relationship and uh, the capacity to have relationships and build those things. Um, and what's a message for men's hearts who are in who are in that stage of life that you've seen? that is so important to them? What do they need to hear? Steinbeck has a line mm. in one of his books talking about a character. If this is a mother saying it. Um, a boy becomes a man when a man is needed. Mm. I have seen boys be 40 years of age because there was no need for men. And the message I would say to these guys is, we need you as men. We need you to grow up. We need, to, we need you to put behind childish things. We need you to, you know, accept responsibility. My definition of masculinity is the joyful pursuit of sacrificial responsibility. I think that's when a man is uniquely and strangely alive. When I'm joyfully pursuing sacrificial responsibility, giving myself in something that matters for those I love. And I'd say these are, these are beautiful years not to squander. In your late teens, early 20s, you are sowing the seeds for your future. You are shaping, you know, the, the, the kind of man you'll be at 40. You are, you, you have no idea, um, the, how the decisions you make will frame your middle years. This is, uh, both terrifying. And it's also amazing because you've got the gift of time. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I opened a Roth IRA when I was 23, and um, no one told me to. I just talked with someone. The biggest f frustration of my life is I did not max that out every year. No one told me to. I had no one saying, hey, you should really do this now. I put as little as I could to open the account. And I'm like, gosh, this is not an exaggeration. I would have hundreds of thousands of dollars more money now if i'd gotten my early 20s right and um you know i'm a big believer in the grace of god and yeah all that but it's that sort of thing you've got time time is your greatest asset um you are it's it's a season of sowing not a season of reaping and so this is when you're putting the seeds in the soil of your future life and so sow wisely and make sure you sow something uh, because a lot of times you're going to get later in life and look for a harvest, but it's not going to be there because you didn't plant it. So we need you, and we need you to start building the life God has for you and to do it sacrificially and joyfully. I, I, if I could say something to a generation of men, here's what it would be. I see most guys waste their 20s. They view it in modern society. They view it as a decade of exploration, redoing your teenage years. And I often, t I, when I talk with people in their 40s, a lot of them are like, man, I wish I was more serious in my 20s. I wish I'd leveled up then. I wish I'd committed sooner. I wish I'd embraced responsibility. Uh, I wish I'd been a little more honest with my strengths and weaknesses and really tended to those things. So, yeah, we need you. Grow up. Become a man. We need men, not boys. And yeah. uh, sow the seeds of your future. It's a good word, man. So... You know, just kind of continuing down this road, what's a message you want men kind of where we are, 30s and 40s, kind of those, just those warrior years? I mean, we are just kind of fighting, advancing. What What's a message that men in that life stage need to hear? You know, Ronald Rollheiser says, when you are young, you struggle to contain your energy. I mean, listen, man, you want to, your, your libido's out of control body's pumping with testosterone, super competitive. And, uh, but he says in midlife, you struggle to summon your energy. You know, you sort of had a, a long enough time in the workplace and you've cu accumulated enough responsibility where it'll just sort of beat the stuffing out of a man's soul. Hmm. And it's, if you're not careful, you will find yourself drowning, slogging through the middle years where you feel like there's not much to look forward to. You've done most human experiences. 
you've probably had as much sex as, you know, as, as a man can have at that age. You've probably made enough money to not, you know, you've probably accomplished it. And you're sort of looking around and going, yeah. more work for diminishing rewards for another 40 years. And so it can be a very demoralizing time. So it's very, very important, I think, in, in middle years to have an honest evaluation as to who you actually are put away the illusions and really start asking God, how do I live a life of meaning? Uh, Victor Frankl uh, said the way, to, the way to find meaning is not to ask, what do I want out of life? That's what some in their 20s ask. What do I want out of life? What do I want to be? In midlife, you're asking, what is life asking of me? And then how do I handle that with grace and with integrity and with courage? And in middle life, you're often getting sandwiched. I feel this right now. Um, parents with failing health, Kids in college just bleeding me dry financial. I'm getting hit both ends, and I sort of like I feel like I'm giving and giving, mm. trying to keep my head above water. And so mm. those years, you've got to realize the pressures, and um, you've really got to you've got to fight for wonder. You know, this Sunday I'm preaching on acedia. It's called sloth and the seven deadly sins, but it's really not just about physical laziness. It's about the loss of passion, and you can you can have a kind of resignation. This is all there is. There will never be more. It's just going to be hard. There's no joy left. Mm -hmm. You've got to fight that because um, you've got to summon your energy for your second life because it's about to get glorious. Yeah. And I'm right now in the early stages of glory. Love Both it. of my kids are out of the house. We're empty nesters. 25 years of marriage, still into my wife. She's my, she you know, texted me yesterday, you are literally my best friend. I love you. And I, I, just a tiny little text. I just was like, what a miracle, man. This woman's seen me at my worst. Mm. And she's still like, you're my day one bestie, still going, let's go. Words of life. I'm, I'm still so in love. Good. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, so now I'm fighting for a life of meaning and mm. wonder. Mm. I, I'm not going to just let my heart die. I'm not just going to shut down and mail it in and get stuck in the middle. I want I want a full inheritance. I'm going to keep pushing in. I think men need to be reminded of that. And then they need to have mercy on themselves. Oh, you that's know, good. Guys beat themselves up. They're still so trying true. to prove their dad's wrong. Still, now you've got the comparison groups or your friends in college still tracking with online. They're doing better than you. They look more successful. You can start really feeling shame or uh, guilt for uh, early mistakes in your life. And you can't do anything about those. You can, you can redeem those. You can learn from those, but you can't undo that. And so it's get, having mercy on yourself getting on with uh, what God's called you to do, and then really making a push for a life of meaning, not necessarily significance or success. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, and then one we one reason we're walking through this is because listeners of Man to Men are young men who are uh, maybe looking at kind of what we tend to say is the college years, but maybe finishing up high school, primary school, headed to that next thing in their 20s. We've got men kind of where we are, 30s and 40s, just grinding it out, trying to find that wonder. Yep. Are your 50s and 60s yep. kind of those king years where you're thinking like, I've arrived? Is that is that part two of having to fight for that wonder or is, or is it a little different? You know, when I turn 50, which is in a few years, I'm going to talk more about it because I feel like I need to get there before I'm an expert. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm only, I'm a, I'm a travel agent, not a tour guide about my 50s and 60s. But I do have some very godly mentors, uh, those age, those ages who speak into my life. And I think, you know, one of, one of the things they're starting to think about a little bit is legacy. Yeah. And they're starting to think about investing in the next generation. Uh, you know, your 50s, 60s, and 70s are, are often the most fruitful years of your life. You know, this is when you've got sort of enough wisdom, still got some energy, you've learned a lot, high skill set. You can often make a you know tremendous difference, really, really. Those years can be very, very fruitful. I can see, by the way, as I head into my 50s, God willing, these could be the most fruitful years of my life. I can see mm. how, just in terms of structure, energy, wisdom, experience, these could be very fruitful years for me. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, you, you start to think about legacy. Most of the financial decisions I'm making now are not for myself. I'm literally thinking mm. about my grandkids. Right. I'm thinking about my children. I'm thinking, how do I help them with a down payment for their house? How do I, you know, with interest rates bad in a bad market, what can I do for others? Um, hopefully, at that point, your identity is secure and you're still not trying to be the hero. Hopefully, at this point, you're trying to you know, lead a realm in a godly manner so others can flourish. 
and um, yeah, you're deploying a- assets differently. You've you've got less time, so the days count. So I think there's a kind of urgency yeah. and maturity to what you do. You don't want to play games. You don't. You you know your risks. Your risks can still be big, but they're very calculated. Not well, a lot sir. of frivolous uh, sort of stuff happening. Sixties, man. I mean, the guys. W- one thing. Uh, one of my mentors, w- amazing guy, like a Yoda. He's part counselor, part therapist, part life coach, part CEO coach. Amazing guy. Yep. And um, he said he's mm-hmm. done a t- ton of research on his sixties. He's in his sixties, heading into his seventies, and he said the research shows that the older you get, the more your worst traits, not your best traits, come to dominate you. So if you're a jerk in your 40s, you'll be a tyrant in your 60s. Yeah. And if you're snappy in your 30s, you will be mean or cruel in your 60s. And he's like, you have to work disproportionately hard to root out your character flaws because they take on a sort of cartoonishness in your later years. And so I think that's really important. I mean, how many elderly folks do you meet who you just think, wow, your level of poise, conviction, servanthood, kindness, and generosity is exemplary. And you may meet the occasional leader, but a lot of people, it's like, dude, you're always so snappy, or why are you so critical, or why are you so filled with fear or anxiety? And uh, so I think those are years to really step into that sage mode, sort of codify the advice you've accumulated and figure out how you can pass it on so generations can make different mistakes than the ones you've made. Well and said, then man. you want to be kind. You're getting ready to meet Jesus. Mm-hmm. Getting ready to meet Jesus. Amen. You know, you want to, you should be leaning into the fruit of the spirit and to serving others. And these should be years of profound hunger and humility. You know, Paul says, when he talked about in Second, uh, Second Timothy 4, the end of his life, uh, I fought the fight. I've run the race. I've kept the faith. It says the Lord has a crown laid up for me. But he says this, not only me, but for all who long for his appearing. And at that point, you should just be longing. There's very little pleasure this world has for you at that age. And that's when we need the in in your presence is fullness of joy, pleasures at your right hand. That's when you're starting to spend your time in eternity. Um, I, I got to uh, hang out with Eugene Peterson. I was one of the last groups of pastors that met with him before he died at his home uh, in Montana mm-hmm. with a group of young evangelical pastors. And there was times where you didn't know if he was in heaven or on earth, mate. Yeah. You know, he would just sort of lean back. He was in his 80s, and he was just kind of like, he may be halfway home. Mm. Because he's almost like Enoch. He's like, is he just going to... Is he just going to go up there tonight <laughs> instead of stay down here with us? And it was really beautiful to watch a man who'd been a very kind, godly man with a real legacy and passion for Jesus lean into the age to come knowing it was only going to get better and better and never stop getting better. And um, so, yeah, I think you start preparing for that. Amen. Man, thank you. That That's an encouraging story about Peterson. He's a, he's a huge influence in my own life, pastorally and personally. And then I, I do recognize some words that uh, that your sage coach gave you. In fact, I think we may have sat with the same man. Uh, it was a life changing experience and direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, man. So thinking thinking about all that, yeah, I think I think we know who we're talking about. Um, can you preview the new book for us? Kind of staying in the same line. Um, you you have sat with men, you know, f- for years. You've detected these patterns. And I think it's you and uh, did, did, is Jefferson Bethke also a co-author on this one? That is correct. All right. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, what are some lies that you guys have discerned? You don't have to give us all seven of them. You can tease it. Comes out pretty soon. Um, but can you preview the book for us? What are some of the lies that we need to be on the lookout for? And regardless of age or stage. Yeah. So the book's called Fighting Shadows. And let me just take a moment to unpack the central metaphor because it's it's based on a conversation between Peter, Jesus, and Satan, okay? Uh, There's a scene uh, where Jesus comes to Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, Peter, uh, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Now, I I want you to imagine that. I want you to imagine you're Peter, and Jesus tells you, Satan has personally put crosshairs on your soul to fail. You're Job 2.0, man. Hmm. Like, get ready. 
And if you're Peter, you would be like, Jesus, tell me you rebuked him. Tell me you've done something. And Jesus says, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. Now, I think Satan overplays his hand here in his conversation with Jesus. Yeah. And he unintentionally lets us in on his primary strategy to destroy men. So that word that your faith may not fail is the word eclepo, where we get the word eclipse from. And an eclipse is where something blocks the sun so it looks like the sun has disappeared. Now, in ancient societies, they lost their minds when this happened because they didn't have a scientific understanding that the sun was still there and everything was fine. And so what Satan's strategy is, is to stand between you and Jesus so you cannot see his light, his grace, his love, and his goodness. And he wants to put shame, failure, temptation in front of you so you think God is gone and this is all there is. And so our basic vision is like you got to fight the shadows. When Satan steps in front of Jesus with his temptations to make you think you yeah. can't make it, God's not with you, your failure is permanent, you're going to live in the shame for the rest of your life, give up, lose hope, struggle for the rest of your life. We want you to fight those shadows that fall over our hearts when that sort of satanic eclipse happens. So that's the central metaphor. So we basically think there's seven shadows. Uh, shadow of loneliness is a huge one. Men men are more lonely in America. There's a loneliness epidemic with men. Yes, They do Define. not have people with whom they feel they can be uh, honest with. And John Eldridge, uh, in one of his books, talks about the three layers of a man's heart. He talks about the shallows, the midlands, and the depths. The shallows, this is now my my take on his idea, that's just banter. It's like, you know, roll tide. It's like hook 'em horns. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just like banter. Did you see the game? You know, uh, who, who are you voting for? It's cultural issues. The Midlands is our personal problems. Hey, man, I'm really struggling in my marriage. Hey, I'm really wrestling with integrity right now. You know, um, I, you know, it's just our personal problems. But then the depths, these are the wounds. These are the lies we believe. This is the shame. This is the stuff we've never told anyone. Mm. And men, very few men, particularly non-Christian men, have places where they can get to the depths of their heart, which are the things that really control their lives. And so uh, this is a book about how to fight loneliness and build a community of men to help you get to the depths of each other's hearts, to walk in wholeness and freedom. So we think that's a really important one, breaking loneliness and uh, recovering male friendships. Y can you have a book for men without talking about lust? So I've got one on the shadow of lust. Yeah. I talk about uh, what lust is compared to the power of love. Mm -hmm. and how to redirect your sexual energy away from destructive things towards godly things. And this is not your traditional try harder. This is not your purity culture. And this is also not, I understand it's a struggle, so I'm going to give you a pass to wrestle with this for 40 years while you quietly marinate your brain in misogynistic, violent porn. It's not that either. It is a calling into the light. One mm -hmm. of the things that is most compelling about becoming like Jesus is that Jesus, women could trust Jesus. And if you're going to be like Jesus, you have to become a man that women can trust. Jesus is with a woman at the well, and she does not feel, even though she's been shamed and used by multiple men, married five times, uh, she feels completely okay with Jesus when he's there one-on-one. -on -one. The disciples show up and they're like, whoa, shouldn't be one-on-one -on -one with a woman. Yeah. But he doesn't have the Billy Graham rule. He, she feels safe with him. Mm. Uh, the woman, uh, the sinful woman who comes into the house of the Pharisee uh, washes Jesus' feet with her hair. That's not just weird in the Bible. That's weird anywhere ever. Yeah. But how, how much grace and how safe must that woman have felt to face the shame of the Pharisees to find security at the feet of Jesus? So to be, to be formed into the image of Jesus is to become a man that, women can trust. And that's a huge part of how Jesus transforms out his eyes. So yeah, we talk about lust. I talk about ambition. How does a man wrestle with ambition? You know, a lot of times we either want to, we, we hate ambition or we love ambition. And I want to basically make the case, give you a vision of how to redeem ambition. I think ungodly ambition is terrifying and holy ambition is a cultural advantage for a man. And so we've got a chapter on how to 
you know, build holy and uh, ambition. So good, and a bunch of other core yeah, things. Yeah, there it that is. Sort of that's a good. Hearts, that's a uh, good preview. Men, so. Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I think a lot of us will be picking yeah. that one up. So thanks for the continued work yeah. there, John. We we're going to transition into a, a little faster segment here uh, called Everywhere Every Day, and this is really just out of my my own curiosity about how different men spend their day, what they focus on. Yes. habits, those kinds of yeah. things. So just right out of the gate, everywhere, gotcha. every day, John Tyson, what time do you get up in the morning? What's the first thing you got to do? I get up at 4 a.m. and I make coffee. Oh, bless you, brother. Yes. Amen. I'm all, I'm, I'm always, a. that's not, I've just always gotten up that early. Yep. Most of Same. my life. Same. It doesn't feel like discipline to me. It's just like, yo, I'm an early guy. Yeah. No, agreed. Yeah. It's a body clock. Yeah. It's so good. Do you, do yes. you tend to work out, have a physical fitness routine? Walk, walking, walking the streets of Manhattan almost does it. But uh, do you I, have anything? I'm a big, uh, do you know what rucking is? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a backpack that goes Go along ruck. with that. Go ruck. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. That's, I'll do that every morning. That's great, man. So yeah, I try and put in five miles a day. It's 244. I'm at 4.2 miles today. So. All right. All right. You'll get it in. You'll get there. Man, so you... uh you're a busy guy. You're a curious guy, which I think probably fuels you. Yes. Um, is what I'm learning about you. But what are ways that you are able to relax or decompress? Not just the ways you do it, but how do you fight to keep that? Um, you know, I think a lot about sort of load management, playing the long game. Mm. Um, I, I, I run at a hard pace, but it's, it's, it's a very, um, observed and attuned pace which means I'm always thinking about recovery, always thinking about recovery. What did that cost me? How much time off uh, do I need for that? I've preached a ton this year, a yeah. ton this year. So I just said, I'm taking Sunday off. I'm taking my wife out of town. We're going to a hotel. We're going to eat a steak dinner and hang out. I just felt like my marriage needs this. I need this. So yeah, I, I practice the Sabbath every week. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in not just rest and not just relaxing, but in recreation. That's right. A pizza and three episodes <laughs> of, I'm trying to think of a TV show. Yeah. Um, Masters of the Air or True Detective Season 4 will relax you. But will your heart be brought back to life to, you know, fight fear and lethargy? Probably not. So I'm always asking what renews me and um, go, seeing live jazz renews me, my riding mm. motorbikes renews me, getting oh. into nature. Well, you know, when you're in the city, all you see is buildings and I love getting into nature. So yeah, I mm. know those sort of restorative renewing practices and I just sort of have a checklist and, and live those out every week. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, again, I've been, a, I've been a pastor a long time, 27 years. I can honestly say I think I'm loving it more right now than I've ever loved it in my life. I believe it. I lo I'm loving it. I have a gifted team. I'm so grateful for my team. Yeah, you do, man. Uh, and they get a lot of the credit. But um, anyway, I'm so I'm loving. I'm loving it, and I'm making sure that I'm keeping my heart alive. I'm always watching for a divided heart. A divided heart will rob you of passion, rob you of energy. Idolatry is a thief of holy energy. It siphons off passion, mm -hmm. and um, I want to be a wholehearted man. So I spend a lot of time just confessing sin, getting those small things out, and just making sure you know that I'm showing up with an undivided heart. So no, that's so good, man. Stuff Let me like ask that. you: uh, so pastor to pastor, and maybe some of our other our other guys will uh, benefit from this as well. How do you continue to not be bored with the Bible? Is the way I'll phrase the question. Because we, we spend a lifetime in it. And I was, uh, I was talking with some people even just this morning about Psalm 23. And I could just see their yeah. eyes kind of start to roll back because they were so familiar with it. They just thought it was good. You know, oh, okay, here we go. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm like, man, this is a great thing. This is not something to be yeah. bored with. So as a, as a man who spends a lot of time in God's word and in very familiar places in God's word, how do you keep it from being boring? Well, the majority of people are biblically illiterate, mate. They're over familiar with a tiny percentage of passages and completely ignorant of huge, huge swaths of the biblical so narrative. So true. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to keep my, I, I'm, I'm a big, uh, I read the lectionary, you know, um, so I'm in, I get the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, get the Gospels in. Um, 
So I'm always like just refreshing my heart in different parts of the Bible. Um, but to me, man, the Gospels are the most, the last thing I do at night mm. is read the Gospels. Like literally the last thing I do before I close my eyes is read the Gospels. And I, I am living with a revelation, level of revelation into the beauty and ministry of Jesus right now. I mean, I, I, was reading, I was reading this morning about the ascension of Jesus after his resurrection. And I kid you not, I was overwhelmed weeping for about an hour. It was so real mm. to me. It was so real to me. So we become, like, we become like him when we behold him. This is the promise of the new covenant in 2 Corinthians 3. We go from one degree of glory to another by beholding Jesus. And so, yeah, maybe they're too familiar with Psalm 23, but I promise you they can't tell you the seven core themes of the Gospel of John and why they mm. matter. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, again, I, I never leave the Gospels. I'm not a red-letter guy. I'm a whole counsel of God guy. But I, I never leave the Gospels, man. If you want to become like Jesus, you've got to know who he is, what he loves, what he hates, how he ministered. You know, and I think I'm just seeing more things than I've ever seen. So if you feel stuck, maybe you pray, um, you know, Ephesians 1, that the glorious Father may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so you can know him better. You start praying, Lord, take me deeper. Yeah, I, I, this is one of the challenges I give men all the time. Hey, I say, hey, can I give you some feedback? I know you may think you fully arrived at the peak of true masculinity, humanity, and Christ-likeness, but as your friend, you have not. And I want you to know there's more levels of glory for you. There's more power for you. There's more humility for you. There's more anointing for you. There's more love for you. And um, you need to go behold Jesus because I think he's got more for you in the secret place. So uh, encouraging encouraging men to meditate in the, the gospel and keep refreshing their heart in different parts of the biblical narrative. And then mm -hmm. read commentaries, man. We don't. Yeah. I'm, I'm preaching. Now I'm preaching some stuff. I, honestly, I've preached it seven, eight times now. And I'm still learning new things because I'm right? doing yeah. better research and yeah. sermon prep. I'm using different commentaries. I, I will say this. Here's where a lot of pastors get lazy, I think. They, they, pre they do research the first time they preach it. The second time they preach it, they dust off their notes. They mm -hmm. don't re-research it. And they put fresh analogies. And the third time, no one can remember. And they just preach the first thing the first time. And I always want to go through a process of like, you know, bestcommentaries.com. Is there a new commentary on this? Is there something I missed because I didn't have enough time? I want to learn new things. I want to see new things. So, yeah, keep working in the text. It's a treasure trove. We were not exhausted. So good, man. You're reading some pastor's mail right now. That's a good thing. So you, you yeah. talk some about just like great habits that you have cultivated. Uh, what's a habit you've had to face head on and overcome? Eating too much cake, mm. pastries. Uh, I live in, uh, I'm in. Where I am right now, okay, I'm on 44th Street in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. Mm. I am surrounded by so much mind-boggling food. Hell's Kitchen in the neighborhood is just all restaurants. Yes. And uh, so, you know, if I wrestle with any of the seven deadly sins, I probably wrestle to some degree with all of them, mm. but the big one would be gluttony. All right. I, lo I fast regularly. I, I probably, I mean, I'm, I'm a disciplined faster. But I feast by instinct. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's definitely oh, yes. been the biggest struggle of my life. Mm. Yeah. That's good, man. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, another thing I'll sit with men a lot on, and I just want to hear from you just everywhere, every day. How do you sense the Lord's direction for you? And can you share about the last time you felt directed by the Lord? There's, a, you know, where it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We all know that in Greek, that means umpire. It's the, you know, the, the verdict giver. Um, I, it's a combination of wise counsel, prayer, listening, contemplation, examining my circumstances, awareness of my heart season. But really what ends up happening is that, that, that kind of peace settles in. And here's how I would explain it. You're, say you're trying to make a decision and you're doing a pros and cons list, which is not the best way to make a decision. But you, you're swinging one way and you're swinging the other way. In. And then I'll just keep sitting in it until the swinging stops. And then it's something just sort of settles in and there's a peace that takes over your heart. This is in conjunction still with counsel and seeking the Lord and praying and worshiping and surrendering. And then at some point it sort of settles in my spirit so much. I'm like, 
I'm ready to go to war on this. I'm ready to mm. get fired on this. I'm ready to take on the city of New York on this. Yeah. Or I'm ready to move apartments. I'm ready, whatever it is, I'm ready to make a major decision. So sometimes that can happen very quickly. Other times it takes months. But it's really like an inner discernment. And then I'm assuming that because I want to please God, that he's going to help me. You know, he's, I will instruct you and teach you the way that you should go. I will guide you or counsel you with my eye on you. Praying Colossians 1. You know, I want to be filled with all the wisdom and knowledge the Spirit gives. So Holy Spirit, give me insight. I don't want to just look at my circumstances. I want to please you. Guide me. I'm open. Intervene. Speak. Correct. Instruct. And then this is a crazy thought. Ready? Listening. Yeah, so hard. Listening, Lord, in silence. Is there anything? Is there a phrase? Is there a verse? Is there a memory? Um, yeah, is there a sermon I've heard before? Is there a wise word from someone? And then the Holy Spirit will often take those things and apply them to your heart in a very meaningful way. So I would say this, ready? A lot of times, if you want to do the will of God and you're hungry for it, you won't miss the will of God even if you're uncertain. Yes. He's not trying to play hard to get. He's That's not right. trying to he's not trying to set you up to fail. Mm -hmm. He is committed to you being conformed to the image of his son, walking in good works that he has prepared. And a part of that is faith, you know. So good. It's yeah. it's Luther. Here here I stand. I can do no different. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to trust these are my convictions and it's up it's I surrender myself. This is Jesus on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Mm -hmm. No, it's so true, man. I mean, I, I, God's not waiting for you to mess up his will as if you could as if you could I, I feel like I spend more and more time trying to get uh, men of all ages to actually really believe and live out the fact that God likes them he is for your good yes yeah yes well man uh, just to, to kind of wind up today is there a project or a, an area of creativity that you haven't gotten to work on yet but you'd like to yes 100% cultural apologetics man I want to make Jesus not just plausible but desirable in the world again. I want I want Western culture talking about Jesus and the kingdom of God. Uh, because we've banished in many ways the Christian faith from public dialogue, yeah. we've got s sound bites and snippets, but not a meaningful engagement with Jesus and his word. Mm. Um, we, are, we are riddled with problems for which the gospel is the answer, but no one wants to talk about it. And I would love to find a way to sort of get into the Areopagus and show people while the God you are looking for, uh, the answers you are seeking that you do not know, let me tell you about him. This is Jesus. So, yeah, I'd love to get into that. That's probably a project for my 50s. That's great. Love looking ahead. Can't wait to see that one, man. May the Lord bring it yeah, quickly. Thanks. Uh, John Tyson. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor for pastoring us a little bit today. May the Lord just continue to bless and keep what you guys are doing up there in New York and, and really even beyond that with some of the influence and things that he's given you these days. Um, grateful to have you here, brother. Well, thanks so much. And I just want to say uh, to the folks who tuned in and listened, thank you for investing the time uh, to, to listen to these things. My real prayer is that God will just fill you with vision, patience, hunger are for him, and that you'll continue in your journey uh, to become like Jesus. Keep pressing in. We need mm -hmm. you. Amen. Hey, John, uh, if some of the guys want to check out you, check out Primal Path, check out the new podcast, where, where would you send them to? Yeah. Uh, so if you want to check out our book, we've got an amazing special on it right now. Here's what I mean by that. If you buy it now, it doesn't come out for a few months. Even if you publish this in a month, it'll still be a few months. Mm -hmm. If you go to fightingshadows.co, they will send you a copy of the book immediately, and then you'll get another copy of it when it's actually published. So it's sort of like a buy one, get one free. Oh, you can't beat that. Months early. That's on, it's only through fightingshadows.co. Um, I've got stuff for fathers and sons at primalpath.co, formingmen.com, johntyson.org. But I would say this, if you wanted to help me, um, I have a weekly email I send out for men every week. Yep. And um, it's like I'm really trying to give you a very potent formative thought for your week. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to shoot junk in your inbox. I'm giving you like the best, most formed thought I have that week. And uh, you can sign up for that at primalpath.co. And there's a link there for that newsletter. No, that's good, man. And, and gentlemen, he means it. I get that email every week and it's always deep, encouraging, 
very profound. So, John Tyson, thank you again for joining us today on Man to Men. My an honor, thank you. Man to Men is a creation of Beta Upsilon Chi, the nation's largest Christian fraternity. We're commonly referred to as Bucks. You can find out more about Beta Upsilon Chi by transliterating our Greek letters and adding a .org. That's B-Y-X dot org. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please support the work. Keep it going by clicking the link in the show notes. Uh, help us expand. Tell other men and share about us on your socials. We are produced by the good gentlemen of the good podcast company. Producer Bradley is at the helm over there. Until next time, I'm Dr. Jared Musgrove with Man to Men. Man to Men.